2.3 is the adjoint of A, which is this collect all the cofactors. And then transpose it. The reason why we do this is the following. What would happen if I would take A and multiply it by, if we go ahead and do the, the transpose and actually get the adjoint, we would have A11, A21, up to AN1, and then A12, A22, up to AN2, and then A1n, A2n, up to ANN. If I would take A and multiply by each of these values, What we have is A11, A12, A1n, A21, A22, A2n, AN1, AN2, ANN, that matrix times this matrix, A11, A21, AN1, A12, A22, AN2, A1n, A2n, a and N. If I would take row one times column one. Now what was, since I did a transpose, right? Column one was row one's cofactors written as a column. So I took row one's cofactors, write it as a column. If I would multiply, wait, that's row one, that's row one's cofactors, that is just what? The determinant of A. But what would happen if I would take row one and row two's cofactors? What would it spit out? Zero. Row one and row three? Zero. Zero. But then, then we would take row two, row one, oh, that's a zero, oh, that's a determinant of A. What's going to happen here? I get the determinant of A on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else by that lemma. But if I would factor out the determinant of A, this is really the determinant of A times the identity. So if I would take the determinant of A on this side, what have I just found? This matrix times this matrix is the identity. It's the inverse. And so we can calculate the inverse by moving the determinant of A across and just using the adjoint. If you want to go through it, the Kramer's rule is based upon the adjoint, right? And so, again, I'm going to find uh, the adjoint of A. It would be a11, A12, A1n, AN1, ANN, transpose of all the cofactors. And the whole point of that is to take advantage of that if you would take the, the adjoint and multiply it by A, it would spit out the determinant times the identity, be the determinants down the identity. In other words, if you would factor out the determinant, move it to the other side, you could calculate inverses by <coughs> calculating the determinant of A and then just simply multiply that by the adjoint of A. As long as the determinant is not zero. And so Kramer's rule for that theorem first off, 
A inverse exists. Is the assumption here? It says non-singular. Understand when we ever have a word singular or non-singular is the idea of if it's non-singular, it means it's invertible, which means A inverse exists, which means that that thing can be actually calculated. And if you would let B be in Rn, and you were supposed to solve if I would ask somebody, hey, can you solve AX equals B as a system of equations. Like, and how would we do that? If it is invertible, if we kind of look at it that way, um, that would mean that I could multiply the inverse on both sides, and so the solution would be A inverse times B. So you could just multiply the inverse on both sides. That's A inverse times A, which are inverses, becomes the ident identity. Left hand multiply A inverse B. So we can actually solve it by doing this. And, you know, part of that problem would be, so if I would go through this entire solution, I could calculate the inverse like this or calculate the inverse in another technique, find the inverse, multiply by B, it would spit out the solution that we were trying to find. But that would still require us to calculate the inverse. But we could kind of use it in the middle of this. And Kramer's rule itself would be, if I would take A, And we would define AI to be A with AI replaced by B. And so what would happen for this solution is I take A, and so this idea right there has, for example, what would A1 be? A1 would be B in the first position, and then we would have the second column, the third column, up to the nth column. And then what would be A2? Well, I would go to the second column and stuff the B in there, and then we would just continue with that process. So I just make a bunch of matrices as I go throughout by just simply saying, okay, I put B in the first column, put B in the second column, put B in the third column, put B in the fourth column, put B in the fifth column throughout. Kramer's rule just simply says that X, which is a solution, which is A inverse times B, is, if we look at X, it's obviously made up of the first number, the second number, up to the nth number as we go through it. But what happens is, how could I calculate the first number? The first number would be just calculate the determinant of A1 and divide by the determinant of A. And then the second number, and so that would be X1. Take the determinant of A2, divide by the determinant of A, and that would be X2, etc. All this is taking advantage of is the definition of the inverse. You just plug it into that right there, and you would do that multiplication and have an expansion for it. And so it's like, okay, this is just another way of looking at If I did do it, I would multiply it. And so it's writing these solutions in terms of determinants. So that means I could go through and solve each of the coordinates for x1, x2, x3 by just simply calculating determinants if calculating determinants was not costly, which isn't too bad if you use calculate the determinant by elimination. That's a lot faster than determinants by cofactor. And so this allows you to use a determinant technique to solve it. And the other is if we look at it, we'd have to do n plus 1 determinants. Right? We'd have to find the determinant of a, and then the determinant of a1, a2, a3, up to an, and then you just simply divide those and you get your solution. So to do this as a process, so there was a homework problem, which one? Two, three, what? Two. Let's see. So two, three, two, if we would look at it and say 2.32C, 
you would have your system of equations, which is 2x1 plus x2 minus 3x3 is equal to 0. We have 4x1 plus 5x2 plus x3 is equal to 8. And then negative 2 <coughs> minus, sorry, negative 2x1 minus x2 plus 4x3 is equal to 2. And this is my system of equations. Um, what are the things that you should be able to do? You should be able to do substitution. How would you solve that by substitution? You would pick one equation, one variable, solve for it, and substitute it into the other two, and you would go from 3 by 3 to 2 by 2, and then solve that 2 by 2 by picking one equation, one variable, plug it into the, third, the other equation, and you get one equation with one variable, which you can solve, and then you back solve until you find all three solutions. You should be able to do elimination. And elimination would go through here and say, all right, for example, I could take the first and second equations and add them together, which would eliminate the x1 and make a new equation. And then I could take uh, one of, of equation two and two of equation three, add those together, and that would, that would make another equation of only x2, x3. And so I've gone from three equations, three unknowns, to two equations, two unknowns, and then I solve those, again, by elimination if we choose to do it. You should be able to do, after that, what are the other things we should be able to do to solve it? Three, we should be able to do an augmented matrix. And then plus Gauss or Gauss-Jordan. Your Gaussian elimination on the augmented matrix, it's another thing we should be able to do. And other things, when we look at this, we could then, at this particular point, we could start moving into, so make sure that you're able to do all three of those, because this will be on the exam. You're going to have to be able to do them all. Um, the other is, so copy, paste, then we should be able to do four matrix algebra, which is what's equal to A? What's A? 2, 1, <coughs> negative 3, 4, 5, 1. What's X? X1, X2, X3. And then what's B? 0, A2. 0, A2. And then this system becomes AX is equal to B. So X would be equal to A inverse times B. How could you find A inverse? We would, The easiest way to do that would be to take 2, 1, negative 3, 4, 5, 1, negative 2, negative 1, 4, augment with 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and do all of the row operations necessary, right? We just do row ops <coughs> until I get 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and over here will be A inverse. You probably ought to use the determinant to see if you even should do this. So for example, if the determinant was zero, what would you know immediately as you go through this process? It's, like it's not invertible, right? And so we're going to have an issue with, as you, you probably should have rather used this one, because that will always tell you what. If you go ahead and do Gauss-Jordan elimination, if it has a unique solution, you'll find it. If it has no solution, you'll find that. If there's an infinite number of solutions, free variables, you'll find that. 
So that's what's nice about that. You can say, hey, which, which of the three types is it? On the other hand, if you're saying, oh, I'm just going to take inverse of both sides, it's like, well, you just assumed that it actually is invertible. You should check that probably before you do all that work. Just take the determinant, to, yeah, should I, should I do it or not? All right. But on the other hand, most of the problems you're given are invertible, or else we wouldn't be asking you to solve it. Except for the last couple of problems on the test, I might ask, hey, <laughs> is this invertible or not? Anyways, and so you would do that, and then you would just plug that in. Now, Kramer's, now we're up to, what's the fifth way to solve a system of equations so far? Kramer's is, is essentially this. For this problem, x, which is equal to x1, x2, x3, is just going to have, we would look at this and say, for our problem, for above, a was equal to, so, 2, 1, negative 3, 4, 5, 1, negative 2, negative 1, 4. B was equal to 0, 8, 2. And so what does that make A1? Kramer's rule says go in here, and it's weird that they give you these numbers, right? We, we probably should call it, instead of A1, they should probably call it C1, because it looks like it's based upon A. We're making an entirely new matrix. It's the first Kramer matrix. What's the first matrix? Is go to A, and just get rid of his first column and plug in B. So 0, 8, 2, and then we have 1, 5, negative 1, negative 3, 1, 4. A2 says go to A and just put B in the second spot. And then A3 is go to A. And then put B in the third spot. So we have four matrices now. And then what we have to do is we have to say, what is the determinant of A? If you look at that, you could do, there's no zeros, so cofactor expansion is going to take a little bit of work, right? But it's doable, right? It would be three two by two matrices that we could calculate. So you'd have to figure out that. You'd take the determinant of A1, all right, what's the smartest thing to do? A cofactor expansion would probably go pretty quick. Either use row one or column one, it really doesn't matter. Why would row one maybe be better than column one? Because of that one, right? <laughs> Zero, one. It's easier multiplication. There's a number one here, the other one has an eight and a two. So it's like, oh, the zero, the one, and the negative three multiplication is a little bit easier. So you would calculate that. You would calculate the determinant of A2. We could take column two or row one, probably pick row one again, it has smaller numbers. And then you would calculate the determinant of A3. And here I'd take row one again because it has smaller numbers. And then you would just simply say, what's x? It's equal to, you would just go ahead and take the determinant of A1, divide by the determinant of A. You would take the determinant of A2, divide by the determinant of A. You would take the determinant of A3, divide by the determinant of A. And that is a matrix, <coughs> is your solution. Um, one of the nice things about Kramer's rule is a, it's, it's essentially what's the idea of like a, kind of a forward acting algorithm, right? As I do it, is there really any thought? In other words, if I would go back to here and I would do the work from here to here, what do we have to figure out? The row ops. What are you going to do to make this a one? You make everybody below it a zero. Well, what times this is this? And then I'm going to subtract. I make all those zeros. And we go through that entire process, right? What's the difficulty of an augmented matrix? Exact same issue. It's a bunch of row ops and back solve it. What's the problem of elimination? Right? What's the problem of substitution? Pick an equation, pick a variable, plug it in the other one. Let's do a bunch of algebra. There's usually a lot of, of college algebra level stuff that you do in your head. 
what time is this is this, and I have five of those and six of these, and they go together, and wait, I subtract, it should have been minus one, not 11, because I got that back, right? So you have those sorts of things that you do. What's nice about using the determinant method? At any time, was there, hmm, what do I do? Or is it immediately, it's this, 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 do this, do this, do this, do this, the numbers come out, and you're done. Just definitely just march right through. Just follow this. Don't don't think about it. Just follow the rules. It will spit out an answer. Very much a forward algorithm. But you have to know how to use the algorithm. What's nice about it is it just it's a bunch of determinants. So if you don't know how to do determinant, you're going to get good at it. And if you don't want to think, you just say, I'm going to use row one cofactor expansion, row one cofactor expansion. Everybody okay with that? Any other questions? Can you go back up to A? Up so to? Which? That, that a. Yep. So when you do a uh, elementary type three, it doesn't change the determinant, right? Nope. So we could add row one to row three, <coughs> make the determinant. Yeah, like here. let's say we want to do that one, right? Let's say just go ahead and take this. And say <coughs> that would be. Calculate the determinant of that, right? Now, as long as I do, if I if I stick to only type three row operations, right? That means the determinant will not change. And so, if I simply stay with type three, that would mean that this would be directly equal to the determinant. I'm just going to add one and three. And so this is 2, 1, negative 3. That would be 0. Add two, add 1 and 3. What do I get? 0, 0, zero, zero, one. zero, zero 1. Awesome. Right? And then I would take, say, so this was row 1 plus row 3. That's how I got to that. Right? So to get here, I did simply said row 1 plus row 3 equals new row 3. Now, what would you get to get a new row 2? I would just simply take row 2 plus a negative 2, row 1, to get a new row 2. That's still a type 3, right? Just add mul any, and it actually could be any multiples, right? Just add multiples together. If I do that, what does this become? 0. 0. Negative 2 of these and this. 3. Negative 2 of these and this. Okay, so what's the determinant of this? Six, so we're done. If you stay to type three, it's just equal. Well, I want to multiply by fractions. Start thinking. And how, what would you do? Let's say you wanted to write this as an equality. Let's say we started, that was all type three, right? Um, what happens if we would try say the same problem. Let's add, say, type 2 and type 3. So I'm starting off with 2, 1, negative 3, 4, 5, 1, negative 2, negative 1, and 4. Let's say I would take this here and I took 1 half of it. So that's 1, 1 half, negative 3 halves. These are not equal anymore. How would I get, I took one half of that, what happens to the determinant to get back to the real one? Okay, so what we had was, what I'm going to do is this. So if I would take an E type 2, and times A, which means, I'll call this, say, B, which is row equivalent. 
And so what happens here? I would take on this, the determinant of this is obviously the determinant of this. But what is an E type 2 determinant? It's just a half. It's whatever you multiply by, right? Which is alpha, right? And so it would be alpha determinant of A is equal to whatever the determinant of the result was. But if I wanted to have, but I, what I really want is the determinant of A by itself. And so what happens here? The, the determinant of A is 1 over alpha, the determinant of B. You have to undo it, right? You multiply by alpha, you need to divide by it. So what does that mean for these? This is the determinant of A that I do not know. What is it? It's 1 over, what did you multiply by? The determinant of B. Which is going to be what? It's multiplied by 2. And so that would be a 4, 5, 1, negative 2, negative 1, 4. Is everybody okay with that? And so if you want to still write it with these equal signs, if you multiply a row by a half, you need to div divide whatever determinant on this side is by half, so you get back to the original. And if you do a type 1, like you do a row swap, what would you put out in front here? Switch the sign. And then, oh, it's a negative. Switch the sign. Oh, it's positive. Switch the sign. Every time you do a row swap, just switch the sign. And so as you go through it, you could actually write equality. You just need to remember what you do. Well, I multiply a row by a 5. Divide by 5. Multiply by a half. Uh, divide by a half. Multiply by 2. And obviously, but the moment I did that, look at these two problems. Am I doing anything wrong? No. But the moment I did that, which looks harder? That problem or that problem? How many people love fractions? They're a little bit harder to work with. But what, one of the reasons why you make a one, though, why do we want ones? Because it's easier in our head to figure out, okay, what times a one, when I add it to four, makes a zero? Minus four. Makes life easier for us. Is everybody okay with that? Three by threes are good ones just to practice the techniques. Especially ones that you already know the answer for. Yeah. 